Hello and welcome finally to the last installment in the uh, Interwar Peacekeeping, Peacemaking, Peace Destroying League of Nations series. So, um, let us now talk about the uh, death and the decline of the uh, League of Nations. So, obviously it would be focusing more on the mistakes and the inadequacies of the League, such as the inability to stop permanent members, from doing the pursuing their own rampaging agendas and the fact that the uh, unanimous vote had basically prevented any single uh, motion to pass effectively so let's go back to talk about hitler for a bit because his main priority from 34 was to rearm germany acquire liebenstraum living space and expand das deutsches reich and the unification of the German peoples, pan-Germanism, so again, pursuing his own agenda. So in 33, he withdrew from the League and the disarmament conferences using France's refusal to cooperate as an excuse. So, um, Austrian Nazis murdered the Chancellor, Dolphus, and Mussolini was friendly with the guy, so he put a... Uh, Italian troops on the Brenner Pass on the Austro-Italian border, so the Austrians would not try to do something to Italy. So there was a reunion with the Saar when, because when the Saar people voted to go back to Germany, Hitler tried to do conscription and rearmament to build up the German military forces. The Anglo-German Naval Convention basically gave Germany uh, an increased size in the navy and allowed it to become 35%. Uh, which is, of course, much larger than Versailles, but the Germans are just exploiting every single loophole and every single so-called negotiation they can get. Uh, Remilitarizing the Rhineland and the collapse of the Stresser front drove um, Italy towards uh, Germany, and Hitler remilitarized the Rhineland, and the League condemned it but couldn't and did not do anything. The Great Depression contributed to nationalism, a key theme here, nationalism in Japan, which basically made everybody decide to become nationalist and for the emperor and Tenoheka Banzai and go to invade Manchuria. Italian living standards fell during the 1930s because of the Great Depression and further drove people into the arms of Mussolini to support fascism to make a great and powerful Italy so you can get jobs and earn money and do stuff. Wages were cut for both factory and agricultural workers by the ruling class, so that was not happy as well. And economic difficulties led Italy to invade Abyssinia to distract from the economic problems and possibly get a little bit of oil as well. So, here's Mussolini in the middle. He looks glorious. Now he looks like a total turd. Anyway, the Pact of Steel between, uh, 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 I think, Hitler and the USSR, I can't remember at this moment in my head, I'm a bit tired, sorry, led to the policy of appeasement because Britain has, was trying to avoid a conflict but playing the hand that feeds the dog, but the dog has rabies and would bite you. And, and this basically made Hitler more and more powerful by giving him more and more stuff, so that's a bit stupid. Great Depression France was less, it was less eager to stand up to Hitler given that it had no money and basically not many people wanted to fight given that their fathers had suffered in the last war. And France had to focus on itself before it could rearm. The same for Britain because, again, the last war you depleted every single thing. Not to mention Brit the Brit uh, Britain's empire was crumbling a little bit and everybody decided to become a commonwealth or a dominion. So it had, instead of relying on direct orders to get what they wanted, they had to negotiate. And just basically took longer time and it was more uh, labor intensive. And it was harder for Britain to get back to its pre-war stages, which it sadly couldn't. Sorry, it's a bit noisy outside my boss's uh, teaching class. After not joining the league, the US decided to go isolationist. And it's like, why? 1935 to 37, there's a neutrality act because Congress said that the US would be neutral. And Woodrow, uh, sorry, not Woodrow, sorry, Roosevelt decided to pull a four term thing later. And then he was like, no, we will not go into wars. But then you went into a war. Soviet rearmament began in 1930, which was accelerated quickly by the infamous five-year plans, which you should also take note if you're an IB or IGCSE student, since five-year plans are important when you're studying U uh, USSR and communism and the Cold War and stuff, because China did it as well. 
Britain began some serious rearmament from 1934 of some large military spending. If you go to British Pathé and you watch some films from the late 30s, you will find that there's an increasing amount of like military parades. There's an upgrade on the Royal Tank Regiment, and uh, as we know, the, from around 1937 to 38, there was an overhaul of the equipment. We've got battle dress, and we've got the new pouches instead of the old World War One era tunics and uh, uh, ammo pouches. So it was a it was a, it was a, a large revolution on the military scale. And of course, you had the, the start the the start of the development for a replacement of the SMLE, which became the number four rifle. But anyway, I'm rambling. Next, France commenced large scale rearmament in 36. Too late. But in 36, you had the Mars 36, an excellent rifle. Hitler accelerated the rearmament of Germany sharply in 36 with a four year plan. Where did they copy from? I don't know. I wonder how, where could he, I wonder where he could have copied them from. So, Japan and Italy increased military spending in 38, especially Japan. Italy was more focused on the flamboyant presentation of things, so it was high, but not that high. But Japan really needed to go into Manchuria. So, yeah, they needed everything because they're an island nation with lots of people and too little food and resources. So why not just grab other people's stuff? Stalin sought to increase Soviet security by ending the USSR's diplomatic isolation. Uh, he kind of championed the collective security. Collective security is basically ally. It's basically another name for the allied system. You be friends with someone, and you guarantee that you will defend each other if one if something happens to one of the other, which was basically what happened in the First World War, which is nothing new, except that this collective security would be a little bit more deadly, as we find out in hindsight. In '39, Stalin realized that the alliance of France and Britain wasn't happening, given that the two were still rearming, still unstable, and not really fond of Bolsheviks. And so it did the Nazi-Soviet pact, which only lasted two years before Hitler did a Barbarossa. It was basically a disguise to uh, rearm. If you look at those political cartoons and stuff on your papers, you will find that there's a famous picture of Stalin and Roosevelt in wedding dress and a wedding. And then there's like uh, in bed and stuff, the bear and the eagle. And like, How long will the honeymoon last? So it's... It's a, it's a, it's a, it signifies that it's, it's not going to be forever. It's just a temporary measure. It's just a buy time, and yeah. So the nationalists saw Manchuria as a solution to the Jap Japanese economic issues post depression because it was mineral rich and fast. As you can see from these trains here, lots of Japanese going overseas in trains and stuff. Because Manchuria has a lot of coal, and Manchuria has quite a few resources that Japan sorely needs. And new land allows for new farming, and thus you can grow stuff for. Uh, Japan and why not make it a puppet state as well, Manchuko and stuff. The nationalists were typically member of the arms fo armed forces which were independent of the government, hence the just structure of Japanese society facilitated nationalist action. Given that the armed forces are a separate entity and not government owned, you've basically got a splinter cell, you've got a splinter group, right? You've got you've just got a terror potential terrorist group under your hands, which is dangerous. And look how well that turned out. We got raped so hard over here in Asia. And uh, uh, what else? The uh, the fact that the Japanese honor code uh, and uh, the fervor of the Japanese spirit uh, in dedicating oneself to the emperor as this descendant of Amatsuaru, I cannot pronounce that name, just the devotion of the Japanese peoples to the divine holy and stuff, it's very dangerous, it's a fanatical cult. Cough, cough, ISIS, cough, 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 ISIS again. So as we can see how well extreme ideology and uh, basically an independent armed, quote, armed group. It's like very armed, not just lightly armed rivals and machine guns. It's the bloody Japanese army. Hence, there was a rivalry during the Second World War and leading up to the Second World War between the army and the navy. Uh, you had the... Um, the army did pursue the nationalist policies while the navy tried to maintain a more so-called chivalrous type of warfare, gentleman warfare, but in the end they both sucked, so... Well, not both. Well, so the Japanese navy was okay, I guess. But anyway, I rambled too much. Sorry! Japan had a railway presence in Manchuria after the Russo-Japanese War because they were worried that Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists would try to kick the Japanese out. So, if you control the transport lines, if you control the logistics and infrastructure, you have a stronghold on the territory because you can shift people here, there, and everywhere. And then, like, the time. Oh, look, it's uh, this picture. It's uh, what? Chiang Kai shek, his wife, and there's. Oh, Vinegar Joe, Joseph Stilwell, Commander, 
U.S. commander of uh, commander of U.S. Pacific Forces uh, land land army and stuff in Burma. Joe Stewart looks okay, I admit. Anyway, the warlord running Manchuria also wanted to kick the Japanese out, so the Japanese had to have control of all the major infrastructure to uh, maintain their grasp on the territory. In 1931, the Kwantung Army staged the Mukden incident. The Kwantung Army is a is a is an army corps, is an army uh, group of the Imperial Japanese Army. They staged the Mukden incident in which they just bombed their own, put a mini bomb on their own railway and blamed the Chinese for it and used it as a prerogative to disinvade Manchuria. So yes, as the following point goes, they then occupied most of Manchuria. Fighting escalated a little bit, but then was brought under control in 36. And Chiang Kai-shek, being the corrupt guy he is, didn't put up much resistance to Japan and he signed a truce and then he ordered Jiang to, to kind of withdraw his one of his generals, which is a bit stupid, but whatever, they're the KMT, corrupt at the time. A difficult situation, China was weak and they didn't want to piss off Japan, so it's like, okay, we leave you alone, just stay there. So the Lee condemned Japan's actions and Japan said no, because it's a permanent member, and then they decided to establish a commission to buy time so they can grab all the stuff, and then you have the Lytton Report, and the US and the Lytton Report, the, 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 the Lytton Report said that it was a fake, they got duped, the League of Nations got duped, Chinese China got duped, got psyched, and the Japanese were at fault and the US decided to not recognize Manchukuo, which is the puppet name of Manchuria. It's a puppet state. And then, fun fact, they put the last emperor, the last emperor of China, Puyi, they put him as the state head of Manchukuo, which is very funny. Yeah. Oh, as you see here, the last Chinese emperor on the throne is puppet ruler. China appealed to the League, but the League passed saying members were not to recognize states taken by force. And of course, China was like, y you serious, bro? And the League was like, sorry, bro. And Japan claimed Manchukuo is an independent country and then puppet state and puppet ruler and Manchu should be autonomous but under Chinese sovereignty, which is just stupid since they just, they've already, they're, the Japanese are in it already. Japan walked out of the league because obviously they're, they, they're like this rebel kid that shows up is like, you can't do this to me, I can do whatever I want, so they just walked out. The USA and the USSR were not in the league and these nations would have the most to say about Japan given their... Uh, immediate threats. Japan posed more of a threat to them, but then the USSR walked out, and the USA was like, wasn't in it from the start, so yeah. France and Britain were fearful of losing the fearful of losing their colonies in the Pacific to Japan, and uh, they they lost all their colonies, nearly. Well, nearly. You lost us. You lost Hong Kong, Britain. It's, we, we, but thank, thank you for trying, though. That was nice. The Canadians especially. Thank you for your sacrifice. Well, I don't mean that in sarcastic, but like genuinely thank you. You guys laid down your lives for us. Thank you, thank you. France lost Indochina, and uh, yeah, Britain nearly lost Malaya as a whole. Uh, they lost we, they lost Burma, we, they lost Hong Kong, they lost basically everything in Canton, which was a bit stupid, but ugh, the British army wasn't equipped for like jungle warfare at the time. Singapore was most humiliating. I mean, they attacked from the wrong way and they just got chased all the way back. Anyway, Japan was able to veto and slow the League's decision, thus proving that the bureaucracy of the League was nothing but complete stupidity. Britain and France had some sympathy as the Japanese presence in Manchuria was already large, and, but unfortunately Britain and France were too occupied with the Great Depression and had no money so they tried to avoid conflict, and thus it shows that the League of Nations was led by bankrupt people who had no desire to or no stable com willing commitment to commit to an independent in the peacekeeping force uh, the league was a slight not corrupt but a very bureaucratic and very stupid um had a very bureaucratic very stupid policy of like unanimous vote and every and only the permanent members have the power to veto uh, or vote against well everybody can vote against but like only the permanent members can say which objectively say no and the fact that there was no backer the original guy who thought of it himself wasn't here so thus the league of nations to the to this extent was pretty much a failure Whew! i think is that all oh no that's not all sorry here we go let's go to abyssinia mussolini invaded abyssinia in 35 and Mussolini was like, a healthy nation should wage war every 10 years. No, you fascist. You're just being extreme. His aims were to link up Italy's existing colonies and had take revenge for the Italian defeated Adoa from Abyssinia because they got shrecked. 
and to satisfy Italian nationalists who wanted colonies that were weren't granted in Paris treaties and reclaim glory of Roman Empire. This is very obvious. This basically the, the, the empire building. So why did Mussolini believe that Britain and France would permit? Well, because one, their little interests, Britain, and secondly, Britain had proposed a territory deal that would give part of Abyssinia. So it's like, okay, just just don't do anything rash. So yeah, and Mussolini had signed a Straits of France, so it was like, okay, we can do whatever we want. And Britain and France were fearful of Hitler, so they viewed Mussolini as a valuable ally. But look what happened. So yeah, the Wawal incident, in which Italy and Abyssinia clashed at Wawal. Mussolini had built up forces for invasion, Haile Selassie, the emperor of, of Abyssinia, appealed but nothing happened. Then Mussolini invaded and then shrecked everybody because you have this time, instead of the 1896 Adowa invasion with like rifles and this couple machine guns and just just this at, at range and stuff, you have planes and tanks and more cavalry and more advanced rifles. And, oh, and actually no, they still use the Carcano. But anyway. The League made economic sanctions against Mussolini, but it sucked because it was six weeks after invasion. It did not include resources, it just was like money, and Britain and France still wanted to be friends with Mussolini, so they only restricted rubber, which was stupid. Non League countries continued to trade, so basically that meant that the uh, sanction wasn't actually a sanction. There was a lag time, because, like, of course, it takes ages for the order to go here and there. And the fact that you have to discuss the order and sanctions, so it's basically is it's like playing on a server. It's like a world of tanks or world of warships, and you suddenly you're in the Asia server, or EU server. It, it, sorry, it's like you're playing a war gaming game. And for example, you're on the Asia server, or if you're on the EU server, and you decide to play in like I don't know the Russian server or the Asia server, and that you have like two hundred something ping. It's stupid. Britain and France, and, and of course Britain and France didn't close the Suez Canal, so the material's still going. Then there's the Hoare Laval Pact of 35. Hoare of Britain and Laval of France <laughs> made laid a secret agreement that two thirds of Abyssinia to, were to be given to Mussolini and separate land to be given back to the Emperor as compensation. But this secret agreement got leaked and they lost their jobs and Mussolini was like, oh, okay, and he just conquered everything. And the sanctions ended because well, he's just taken over Abyssinia, you can't do anything now. As a result, the emperor went into exile, the league was complete shambles, Hitler exploited the opportunity and saw, so hang on, they are weak, we, I can do what I want. So he went into the Rhineland, the Straits of Front collapsed, Mussolini drew closer to Hitler, the Rome-Berlin Axis was formed and there was friendship and the Axis powers were legit a thing and Mussolini left the league, thus leaving Britain and France against everybody else. The end. And everybody lived happily ever after. Nope, there was a second world war. Anyway, yeah, that's it. That's the interwar and League of Nations stuff. So I guess I hope you've enjoyed it, my ramblings and stuff. And uh, I'll see you guys next time in the next video about the Chinese Civil War, I guess. Oh, well, China's a whole. Anyway, toodaloo. Bye-bye.